Welcome to a screencast we call How a Web Browser Displays a Web Page. Now, this is a very, very simplified version of all of the events that happen when a web browser goes and gets all the files and assembles them and puts them together for a web page. But it's a place to start for all of the other topics that we're going to be covering. Now, I'm going to refer to the web browser as a client browser because, well, it could be a desktop web browser or a mobile web browser, like something you'd find on a smartphone. But it could also be some other application that's able to display web pages. Or in fact, these days, it could be an appliance, a watch, a fridge, or your car. Anything that can go get resources on the web and display them for you is a client, a web client browser. The first thing that needs to happen is you need to tell the browser where to go to go get that thing you want to display. And the way you tell a browser to go get that thing is you use a URL, a uniform resource locator. Let's take a short journey into a little bit of detail about URLs. Up at the top of the screen, you can see the generic form of a URL, and then you can see a specific example of a URL. In fact, this is the URL where you can go to learn more about URLs. The first thing you see in a URL is the scheme or the protocol. These are things like HTTP or HTTPS or FTP or any number of other schemes. Then there's a colon and a double slash that separates the scheme from the rest of the URL. And the next thing you see is a domain. Now this is the name of a server, and it can be the name of a particular machine plus the domain of all of the machines owned by a particular organization, and then usually a top-level domain. Now These used to be simple, like .org or .edu or .com, but these days this could be almost anything. There's an optional port, which defaults to port 80. You can see that a normal web URL doesn't have a port because, again, we're going for port 80. But as you develop web applications, you'll use other ports, like port 3000 for a Rails app. It allows you to run multiple web services on a particular machine. Next is the path to the resource itself. Now this can be a series of folder names if you're just getting a static web page that ends in the name of the file and its extension, for example, .html. Or it could be a more abstract path to the resource in a hierarchy of data if you're using an application programming interface. For example, in some of our Rails apps, you'll see paths that have more to do with what your web application is responsible for than the path to the files in the web application. Regardless, this is how the server knows to go where to get the resource. Now, after a question mark, you might find a query string, but that's optional. After a hash mark, you might find a fragment ID that's also optional. In this screencast, we're only going to be concerned about the domain and the path. So getting back to our client, the URL of the currently being displayed resource is in the top. It's in the location bar. You can type a new URL in there, and the browser will go get the resource you ask it for. URLs also appear in HTML tags inside the resource. These can be for other resources like images or JavaScript or cascading style sheets. The attributes in these tags contain URLs that tell the browser, go to this location and go get a file. It's an image. I want to display it. Or go to this location. It's a JavaScript. I want to run this code. Or go to this location. It's a cascading style sheet. I want to use this as you render the page. Then, of course, there's our old granddaddy of tags, the anchor tag, the reason that this whole thing started. And in there, the hypertext reference is a URL for the next page that the user wants to see. This is fetched when the user clicks on that link. Let's take a look at the simple case of where the client browser goes and gets a static page, just an HTML page. So we start with the URL. Let's say you type it into the location bar and hit return. The first thing the browser is going to do is issue a hypertext protocol command called get. 
it's going to say get this URL. And that command is going to go off across the network in search of the machine that is given in the domain name. And that machine will receive that request, that get request. The machine will then take the path part of the domain and try to figure out where in its database or in its file system it can find what the web browser is asking for. It locates the resource and when it finds it, it returns it to the browser and the browser accepts that file and starts to process it. Let's take a closer look at the processing. The first thing that happens, say to an HTML file, is the browser parses the HTML file. Parsing is a word that means it goes and gets the file and breaks it up into pieces and then starts trying to figure out what to do with all the pieces. HTML contains the text content for a web page plus the structure of the web page. If you can think of it in terms of an outline, it understands that there are headings, there are paragraphs, and these things fit inside each other, and it's all organized in a particular way. Finally, the HTML contains links to other resources. Those are the URLs we talked about earlier. The next thing the browser does is it goes out and using those URLs, it fetches those resources. If there are images that the web page needs, or videos, or anything, the browser goes out and requests those files. While those files are coming back, it goes out and it looks for any style sheets that it needs. Now, a style sheet in the cascading style sheet, or CSS format, determines how the web page appears or how it's presented. It's filled with rules that say, well, if you've got a paragraph, use this font, or if you've got this kind of div, give it this kind of white space. So appearance, positioning, fonts, colors, that sort of thing. Finally, the web browser is going to go out and find any JavaScript files that the web page needs, and it's going to request them as well. JavaScript is how we described how a web page should behave once it's all loaded and ready to go. A browser has a couple of simple behaviors that it knows how to do automatically. For example, if you click a form submit button, it knows how to submit a form. But for all the other things you want a web page to be able to do, all the interactive elements, you use JavaScript. And the web browser goes out and asks for all of these files using those get commands that we saw earlier. And the various servers that contain these resources send them back. This can take a while. But as they return, the browser assembles them into the document and stores its work in an internal data structure of some sort, different for every browser. But in the end, the point of this whole exercise is for it to render the document. That is, to draw the, the document on the screen for you. It renders a visible page and puts it in the window of whatever browser that you're using. It also publishes the document as a document object model. This is a standard way to describe web pages and other documents that allows us to do really cool stuff with them, to traverse them and manipulate them. This used to be a problem, but it's standardized now, and you can write your JavaScript for any browser, and it should execute if the browser is a standards compliant browser. Finally, of course, it takes those JavaScripts and it runs them. The JavaScripts run and they use the document object model to manipulate the web page, to add interactivity, to make the whole thing sing and dance. Now, I'm actually lying to you. The browser doesn't run the scripts at the end. I've kind of implied a one, two, three sequence, but in fact, the browser runs scripts at different times, pretty much as soon as it finds them. But a good JavaScript programmer has means for running the scripts when everything's ready, when the document's ready, or when that particular part of the document that the script is working on is ready. You'll learn all those techniques as you go forward. In the end, it looks like a smooth, fast, and interactive user experience. There's a lot of moving parts underneath the hood, but as far as your customer's concerned, it's just how things work.